like me and another bartender were bitching about guys or something like that and she just came up and was like at least you don't have retarded baby <laughs> and i was like oh god <laughs> and like walked away and i was like and she's fucking right she's that right is, that is a where it's very just like shut thing up you're fine you dumb little american girls that are bitching about you know what i mean <laughs> That so is, that that's is the way that I I picture her. Yeah, I don't that, know if she that is sounds that about way, right. And yeah, she does say retard a lot. Perfect, love her. <laughs> yeah, love I mean, her. That's, that's how I warmed up to her. <laughs> she kept calling you that. She goes, "What's up, retard?" Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What's like, up, uh, retard? Re- reminds, re- reminds me of my drunk mom. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sweet, sweet. All right, speaking guys. Speaking of moms, we're speaking we're of mom moms. Today. We are talking today about. Mom of the year? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Our authorities are desperately searching for a killer accused of going on a rampage. Of the search for a possible serial killer. An urgent manhunt for a man authorities believe is behind a triple killing spree. Police here speculating that a possible serial killer may have struck again. I told her to get out of the car, and that's when she became afraid, and then I shot her. Just an amazing. Well, like almost forty years running. Just to let you guys know, uh, we are going to be talking about kids being shot. We're not going to go really into it, but I just want to kind of put that out there. I don't love doing stories about kids, you know, getting molested, getting killed, that whole thing. But in this story, you will find that it's not the main part. As horrible as it is, and we won't go into the details of it. Yeah, this one has a lot it. to unpack. I, I've been yeah. looking forward to this one since you told me what the topic was. Right. So also we were talking about Diane Downs, Elizabeth Diane Downs, mother of the year. Okay. We should all be so Just lucky to have best. a mother like her. Either way, whether you believe her or not, still mother of the year, right? Still mistakes. That were made, even if you believe her story, which you guys may, I don't know. But even then you go, "Mm, not cool. You know what? Every, every parent makes mistakes with their kids. And sometimes that results in death. Yeah. You're constantly making mistakes with kids. I have no idea what you guys are talking about. I mean, it's just like, I mean, you're just always going to get it wrong. (laughs) You always are. It's fucking maddening. But anyway, uh, on a lighter note, real quick in the beginning, last episode, Patreon episode, not audio, mm-hmm. last episode we did uh, the story of A.B. Shermer, right? The pastor who yes. slowly cra- killed his wife at their house, put her in the car and slowly pushed it into, crashed it into a <laughs> guardrail and waited for someone to find him, right? Mm-hmm. It was the so, perfect crime. Those things are important. And he was a pastor. He was. Minister, pastor, whatever. So I think Same. those things are the only thing you need to know. And something happened to his first wife, too, right? Didn't yeah, she was, fell down the stairs. Yeah, she fell down she was stairs. vacuuming. Okay. Also so we had a up. couple dead wives, with you know, which, you know, detectives don't like that. Mm-mm. They don't like when you have two dead wives from the same thing. Yeah, and I think we agreed on the last episode that it's a little bit of a red flag if you have two dead spouses in your past. Right. Yes. One is okay. Two is kind of the cutoff. Yeah, I think and no, I isn't one not okay either for me. No, but well, every it to depends, each his own. Depends on how it happens. I, I'm a lot more. I think forgiving. we decided cancer was like. Yeah, I, I think cancer be is real acceptable. hard to give some. I mean, and if still you, possible, but difficult. Still possible, and if you do do that, I mean, you're the the hard work and perseverance that you're showing is something that I might like. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Your stick to itiveness, <laughs> the long game. You know, I don't hate it. So yeah, if you candidate. somehow gave your first wife cancer, I'll give you a try. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a date. See how it goes. But anyways, as we did on the snake episode, we kind of put it to the audience to yeah. beat my title, <clears throat> which you guys usually do. My title was creepy. Oh, creep, creep of the cloth. Creep of the cloth. Yeah. Which was and we good. all kind of liked that yeah. one. I've really been looking forward to hearing what the what the listeners have yeah. to say, though. So, Blasty Cat, word up, um, 
<laughs> has three titles. They were all good. I, they were I all good. Go First one, PT her. Cruiser. Damn near, damn near killed her. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Or PT Cruiser, don't even know her, something like that. A.B. Shermer and the P.T. Bruiser. I Ooh. do like that one because yeah, I did want to incorporate Bruiser good somehow. Good band name, too. Yep. Uh, Betty was Pastor Prime. <laughs> what? <laughs> That now, I did really like that, that one when you told me good. about that. So, Blasty Cat, I mean, my goodness. Yeah. You're hired. Put him on the payroll. Uh, Rube, I'm sure it's going to be something insulting yeah, to Jesus. us. Yeah. Let's hear it. Praying and slaying. Not bad. Not bad. That's good. Not bad. Not bad. Rolls off the tongue. Always yeah, very metal. Some, uh, some nice alliteration in my titles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And very metal, right? Oh, like, yeah. as Rube's is, is wont to do. Uh, cruising for murder. <laughs> I like that's, that that's one. That's a good one, too. I like that yeah. one. Rubes, don't insult my intelligence. None of those are winning. Oh, um, <laughs> Rube, Rube knew he wasn't going to win. Did he? Did cruising he, for murder is pretty good. Cruising for murder is really good. Yeah. Robert Humble. Holy PT loser. <laughs> nice one. Nice one. Throw, throw Batman at the end of it. And I'd say uh, it's solid. Holy PT loser, Batman. That oh, one's really, that's, that's good. very good. That's, that's very good. good. Alec like Baldwin. Desperate church wives of the Poconos. Because this took place in the Pocono yeah, Mountains. Good very good. Desperate church wives of the Poconos. That's pretty good. Still, I'm That's leaning very towards, good. I would uh, go Real Housewives. Say like the, the first or the second one, I'd say are my, I my favorites. I know. You crushed it. Yeah, we like Betty was Pastor Prime so far, right? I think that's... Yeah. That, anyway. It's pretty... Yeah, fuck. So James Reese, Sinister Minister. Love it, bud. Oh, that's Love good Love it. Too. That's a really good one. Sterling J. Calvin, PT cruising for a bruising. Now listen. Okay. That's good, too. You know I like that one. Wanathan? <laughs> uh, Wanathan? Oh, Wanathan, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, we you know guys him. know Wanathan? Yeah. Is mm-hmm. he Iconoblast? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Murder on the Pocono Expressway. I do like that, too. Oh. I do like that, too. Matt Bezel, the Holy Driver. Oh, holy uh, driver. A deal so reference, good, buddy. too? So, listen, I mean, we oh. could probably pick it now, don't you think? Yeah, the, you the, can, yeah, the the yeah, the Dio reference is the one that got me. Holy Driver, that's fucking awesome. But any any metal reference is, is right, me. right. I'm gonna say either Betty was past her prime, <sighs> or PT cruising for a bruising. I don't Shit. know. We'll let Those you guys two. know. Dude, this is hard. Wait for the audio um, audio drop on RPR feed to, to see, see which one? the winner. I'm excited to see who the winner is. Those are I'm all gonna really be, good. We can go. We can do a vote after the show. Then I'll change the name on the on the Perfect. on the Patreon. Okay. Um, this episode will have a couple different, I think, good ones. We'll have okay. some good mommy dearest oh, ones. Already, huh? I've already got one, but it'll have to wait till the end. Yeah, my first one was sexy psycho. <laughs> oh, I, I think mine's a little bit better. I'm sure it is. I just kind of threw that out there. Yeah, you got, you got to get something on you the gotta, page. Yeah, you got to, yeah, you just got to go get the and, wheels and turning yeah. for people, right? Mm hmm. All right. Diane Downs. Here let's we go. Get in, let's get into it. Eesh. Um, all right, Diane Downs was born August 7th, 1955, in Phoenix, Arizona, one of my new favorite places. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely wanted to uh, I, move there for a second. For me, that was already a strike against her as soon as I found out about that. Really? It's just too hot there. I, I get I get too hot everywhere I go. At least it's dry heat, though, you know? Yeah, that's what nerds say about, <laughs> about Phoenix. Okay, so she lived with her devout Baptist parents, Wesley and Willadine. Willadine? I have no Willadine. <laughs> We're in the 50s, people, okay? Oh, okay. So Wesley and Willadine Fredrickson. Diane would complain that her parents were very strict and never got her any new clothes, any of the new 80s trending clothes or anything. Poor girl. Probably didn't have a trapper keeper either. 70s stuff. Yeah. (laughs) 
Um, she always had hand-me-downs that she had to cover up and couldn't do anything or have any fun. Um, by the age of 14, though, she became very rebellious, obviously. We now know that very strict parents sometimes breed a rebellious Wild teenager. stallions. Yep. Yeah. So by the age of 14, she became very rebellious, dressing provocatively and dating older boys. One of those boys was Stephen Down. Uh -oh. Downs. So she was actually born Elizabeth Diane Fredrickson, right? Mm. But she's known everywhere as Diane Downs, so that's kind of like... Um, Interesting that she kept the last name for so long. Right, even after? Yeah. I always think it's weird when ladies do that. I huh? think so, too. I mean, if there's kids involved, though, I kind of get that. You need to have yeah. the same last name as your kids to kind of get them. It just makes everything easier. My mom kept easier. the last name. With, like, the, school stuff and everything like that, if you have a different name, people are kind of like, uh. Really? Yeah. It oh. just makes everything, as far as, like, signing them up for stuff or school or registering or whatever, if you have the same last name, it's oh, just okay. yeah, it must pretty been a, smooth. It must have been a nightmare for my parents because I refuse to change my last name. It has always been remarried. a nightmare for your parents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. That enough. goes without saying. <laughs> that, was, that was the least. That the was like the honestly. tiniest thing that they were like <laughs> actually fine with. Oh, well, yeah. He's causing trouble again. Yep. Um, so one of the older boys that she was dating was Stephen Downs. The two dated through high school. And when they graduated, Stephen went into the military. And they decided to keep dating. And they were both going to just stay together, stay loyal to each other. Diane went to Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College in Orange County, California. And the two stayed together. And, and She was definitely cheating on him then. Yeah. Gosh, what made you, I mean, what, what would make you think that, though? Church women. Intuition. In yeah. Orange County. Yeah. <laughs> 100%. No, you're absolutely right. So Stephen, in the military, in the Navy, stayed loyal to Diane and was like, we are totally together. And Diane was uh, not so much, right? Fuck. She I was very it. loose and slutty. <laughs> <laughs> Is that written in your notes? Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. She was loose and slutty. You know, I like to slut shame. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know what's going to happen if you're a slut? <laughs> You you're, you're asking for it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and uh, she was actually expelled from this Bible college no. for promiscuity. No. Now look. Not, not Elizabeth. She was a hoe? Well, but I'm sure that most people's college experience, uh, they would be like, what? She was kicked out for like being a slut? <laughs> we are praised, right? Like, it was a religious school. Most... Yes, but it's religious school. And I think it's even still that way. So... Like at religious you, schools? Or? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah at religious schools, definitely. Yeah, so she was kicked out for... The only relationships they allow are between the uh, the pastors and the, the boys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Nailed it. They're okay was with that. that, that was good. That was life. good. That was good. There we go. <laughs> oh, what? Yeah. What is this? <laughs> you think you deserve that? Joel said I do. No, nice. honestly, I think Cameras was, on him. I think it was a little weak. <laughs> no, that was a good one. I just I want to take it anyway because I've been wanting to try this on. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so are you gonna great. leave it on for the whole time? Um, or unless, do we take it on and off when we have zingers? Uh, I think we're gonna need to trade it. Keep it on for a little bit. Um, looks great. Because it looks great. That's why. It feels natural. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so yeah, she got uh, kicked out for being a a big, huge slutty slut. <laughs> And uh, she had That's to move. In the notes too. She was a big, huge, a big, slutty, slut, huge slut. slutty slut that was slutting all around. Okay, <laughs> got what she deserved. No, I'm kidding. Um, she would move. She would have to move back home, which, as you guys could probably tell, is her worst, the worst possible scenario. So she's at home with her strict parents, back. Uh, you know, not able to be a big slutty slut or dress how she wants to dress or whatever. <laughs> she should be allowed to do what she wants, except that she's married. Because once is she married or no? No, no. they're just dating. Oh, she's no. fine. She just graduated high school. Oh, so have then, sex with whoever you want up up until it's official. Once you get the ring, that's when you have to stop sleeping with other people. Yeah, yeah. is that that's, how it works? It, back then, yes, that was how it worked. It would it would be more well, strict can back you, then. Yeah, like, no, because, yeah, my dad was saying, like, the rules in his family was, like, 
fuck whoever you want. Once you're married, it's over. And that was like yeah. a thing that he learned from his dad. That's like 60s, 70s uh, rules. Yeah, I think that's so it's a, still a sort a of family, applies. Family tr- well, once, but once you're... Like, do whatever. Well, you also get once married you're, a lot younger, you know? Like well, people anytime someone... are in a relationship, someone, though. Like, if it's a boyfriend-girlfriend thing, you're, you're not going to be fucking whoever you want, right? Well, but you're not really sinning if you have a little fun while they're out of town. If you're Does not your married. wife know about this? No, listen, Joel, a this lot a of the time, That's they're married. married. <laughs> a lot of the time, like if I hear people complaining about their boyfriend or like whatever it may be, it's like, dude, you're not, like, before you are married, I mean, do what you gotta do. Isn't that cheating though? Am I, well, am that I depends on what agreement you yes. have decided to make. Yes, oh. it is cheating. It is <coughs> cheating. But what do, what are you losing? You're not losing your house. You're not losing your kids. You're not, you, have, you know what I mean? Like, yes. So the morality of it doesn't matter. It's all about the, the physical possessions that you might lose from it. Kind yes. Of it's the whole point, dude. Uh, yeah, dude. Am I really? The, I was raised in a religious household. I, I probably just need to get with the times. Well, then you should not be having sex with or living with anyone until you're married. <laughs> there are so many other things that I shouldn't have done considering right? my religious upbringing. So well, anyways. I think it's changed. I think like nowadays you can, you people commit now and, and take it as serious as marriage nowadays. But back then it was different. Like back then. You fucking should. You should. But you know, when people beat themselves up for like cheating on boyfriends or girlfriends, it's kind of just like, Yes. That's horrible, especially if you're living together, if you've been together for a long time. Mm. But if you're when you in get the older grand too. Sc- in the grand scheme of like life, it's like don't fucking beat yourself up too much that you cheated on a high school girlfriend or oh, boyfriend. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Something like that. That's or twenties, or you're not living leads. together, yeah, and you're, there's no real like huge right now, commitment. Right? Yeah. But anyways, that's my Better take, and I'm sure people are. Oh, she was going. She was going to do it no matter what anybody told her. Exactly right. Um, so she is expelled. She's living with her parents. Steve comes back from the Navy, and Diane sees an opportunity. I'm I'm assuming because this is how she is. But she convinced him that she will never cheat on him again, and that she needs him, and they need to be together. And Steve, I think, really does love her because he he really puts up with a lot. So I think he's like, okay. Um, So she runs away from home. She starts living with Steve on November 13th, 1973. 1973. Diane and Steven were married and quickly encountered problems. Who knew? No way. (laughs) No, you're telling me that childhood sweethearts started running into issues? The childhood sweethearts that one was cheating on the other and they, you know, one had to run away from home and they had no (laughs) family support. Gosh, what? So they, they encountered problems, money problems, and distrust of Diane was infecting their... Was she spending the money? No, they just didn't make a lot. She worked Mm. at a thrift store. He was out of the military. And I think he kind of had a, from what, from what we hear, he kind of had a problem holding down a job, Uh, which is never fun. And a husband, huh? Mm -hmm. Mm. So they were having fights. They were having fights about money and where you work and why'd you lose your job again? And you, you work at a thrift store. Fuck you, slut. You're cheating on me. Who are these men's underwear that and I he's just like, found? And she's like, I'm not. You're going to have to trust me like for this to work. Um, <laughs> Whose who's underwear are these? They're from the thrift store. Yeah. Those are yours. Yeah. You've been wearing them for years. Oh, P.S. She was cheating on him the whole time. Um, Fuck. Yeah. So his like suspicion of just like not trusting her and having it be a problem in the marriage he was right. Yeah, sometimes you got to follow your intuition. He in was situations. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Diane decided to, around this time, they're having a bunch of problems, not doing great, just got married. Diane decided, you know what could help? Oh, yeah. What fixes every relationship? Always. Three oh, have a baby. Right? Oh. You'll you'll figure it out. Joel. A different kind of threesome. <laughs> Wait until you start facing some. A different fight. kind of threesome. <laughs> uh, Diane decided to stop taking birth control and quickly was pregnant with her first daughter, Christy Ann. 
I was curious, was that a mutual decision or did no. she she stop taking it on her own accord to, Didn't tell him. to get pregnant? Yes, he did, was at that time because they were first married. They were quite young. Were they? I think they were like 18. Uh, no, I think she had her first kid at 21. 21. So they were, they were pretty young and he's like, they're trying to get on their feet. They're fighting about money. What's the worst thing that you can do? Have a kid, which he didn't want to do, but she was like, I'm going to do it, and he's going to really like it. <laughs> um, so uh, she quickly got pregnant, as she does, uh, with their first daughter, Christy Ann. Shortly after that, they had a second daughter because things were even worse. And so, she thought, you know what? One baby wasn't enough to fix this relationship. Let's Gotta have keep another. keep going until it's fixed. <laughs> so they had another daughter, hey, Cheryl that's Lynn. The, that's how the Duggars stayed together. That's how you well, and oh, yeah. stayed together, kids right? and counting or whatever? Yeah. Yeah. Every time I think about leaving, I just have another kid. <laughs> no, no. They're all accidents. <laughs> Us, Nothing was pre-planned. I, I, I think you need to hand these out because I, I think that I think that, that earned it. Oh, it did. You yeah, think it earned it? Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. The life. Um. <laughs> you can take them off. Shortly after their second daughter, Cheryl Lynn was born. <laughs> that was. But are you going to do like oh, the, the whole yeah, thing, the yeah. whole <laughs> thing? <laughs> Music, everything. Run. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. yeah. Okay. All right. Coop. Let's see if you can earn these back. I know. Back. Now, now it's turning into a competition. See if you can earn <laughs> these <laughs> back. Joel's not getting them. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, I'm kidding. Um, so shortly after their second daughter, Cheryl Lynn, was born, the couple's problems continued. Because of money and the fact that Stephen always thought Diane was cheating on him, even after I she, wonder why. after she I told know. him that that he needed to trust her, he still didn't trust her. I know, because by the way, she fucking was. And in 1979, <laughs> the couple's third child, Danny, was born. But Stephen was that a boy or a girl? Boy. That, was, that was a beer that I just opened. These oh. were back in the day. This was back in the day when Danny was. Was well, a male name. Boys, yeah. When people named named their kids fucking the right thing. <laughs> okay. When people Instead the right of whatever thing. this fucking willy nilly shit is we're doing now. Back when men were men and women yeah, were women and everybody were on each slaves, other. Slaves, right? Were slaves. <laughs> Until they were married. <laughs> what? <laughs> um. So, <laughs> what what did you say? Oh, I just said until they were married, then the cheating stopped. That's yeah, all. no. Uh, yeah, no. Allegedly. In the 70s, you According just, to Diane. You partied until married, then it was over. Yeah. Except um, for in this case. So, Stephen became Ooh, convinced that Danny was not his child. Because he wasn't. He came out black. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I know. I mean, luckily, she she could just be like, oh, it is. And he's like, no, it's not. And also, it wasn't. Well, you so, spent all those years overseas. Maybe you just got a hereditary tan. Mm -hmm. Pass it on to the kid. <laughs> the two finally divorced in 1980. Gosh, they had a good run, though, huh? They did. Not How many bad. years is that? Not bad for a first They first got marriage. married in 73. So, yeah, oh damn! Years, uh, not horrible years, for literally not all of the problems that they were having. What a good man! And kids, yeah. and yeah. And he never and, cheated on her, as far as we know. As far as we know, and also after finding out that Danny was not his child, he still was like, "Okay, like I'll do this for a little bit longer." And then clearly, he couldn't handle it anymore. Which husband was it that got the vasectomy? Was that Stephen? So it was Stephen. After ah, this, okay, he's like. Okay, I'll stay with you, but like now I need to know for sure. If you have another baby, I know for a fact it's not mine, right? Okay, so he look, got I, a vasectomy. I, I don't want to be a stickler about this, mm -hmm. but maybe it's a good idea to just run it past me if if we're going to have a kid since we're married and all. Like maybe just discuss it a little bit. That's that's kind of a decision that you shouldn't make on your own. Uh, what it, pulling out was fucking is the brand <laughs> new in the in twenty twenty? I mean, come on. <laughs> It's condoms, true. fucking, there's things he can do, too. Oh, God. back then, condoms were still made out of, like... Leather. Like, yeah, they were still... By the way, they still haven't perfected the condom. They, can oh, we no, be real? No, they're, they're, I don't use them. They they're, still they're have not. Yeah, they're awful. They're awful. Yeah. Just feels a lot better Dirt with bags. that one. <laughs> Dirt yeah. bags. Dirt bags. Dirt bags just came out big time hey, just that, now. 
we we did not endorse. I not was wearing being condoms. you guys. I was being. Yeah, you yeah, guys. sure. Oh sure, shit, sure. you were mocking us. Feel the same. Fuck, I really leaned into that one. I was joking too. How are your genital wards doing, Coop? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that everybody has. Herpetic. No, finally, finally Her herpetic penis. <laughs> mm. All right, so if at I this point, Diane is divorced. She has three kids from two Damn. different dudes. Damn. Um, she's 27 now, something. Young, still. Diane jumps around from job to job, even uh, getting $10,000 for being a surrogate. For another family, so oh, she's pregnant yeah. again for someone else. They How did she her. get pregnant? She was a surrogate. So. Uh, she was she was a whore, Joel. We've been over this already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do you reckon? In the eighties, were they able to uh, implant? Uh, no, I'm he sure, probably, right? I just banged her. Uh, well, they they still was be a able, company that like she he was would still be through. able to to donate the sperm, and then they just use like a. a Turkey baster, an oversized uh, okay. syringe, or something like that, and just fucking shoot it up there. Maybe a super soaker, because super soakers were around back. But in then the it 80s, won't right? be the mom's DNA as well. So is there a true in, surrogate? I don't at, know if they can implant eggs in back the then. 80s. Yeah, I don't. Uh, know. I'm not entirely clear. Uh, but I'm not she, too smart. She actually tried to. Uh, she got turned down when she first tried to become a surrogate because she failed the psychological exam. Yeah, because she was a little bit weird. Just a little bit. But honestly, just a little bit. Like, she looks totally normal. Joel, you've got pictures of her up. Like, she looks like Hopefully a... it's the right person this time. Yeah. I'm sorry about that. That's all right. Did you put the wrong person on one of the episodes? Yeah. Which one? On the last one. So oh, the, the A.V. Shermer? Shermer when I was I like, wanted to oh, apologize put to everybody. a picture of... What was her name? Yeah, it was the, it was the pastor and Cindy... Pastor and Texting Cindy, each other. and I wanted it that to be the there too. That was his, like, ooh. I wanted it to be the newer picture of them where they're both just like fours at best, so I <laughs> talking to each other, mid Midwest fours talking to each other about the things they've done to each other's <laughs> body. Right? And Joel puts up a it picture of me. the dead husband. It was her fucking husband. committed suicide. Oh shit! And Cindy like looking. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wanted the gap in the teeth. I wanted the old gal. I fucked it up. It's all he right. won't we, do it again. No, hell no. I got, <laughs> I've been punished severely <laughs> He's so still far. Getting, still recovering from the beatings. And at the same time, I did too, not. Coop, What is, what is me being me mad? The text. Oh, did you guys know that J- Jesse Wiseman's misspelled? Fuck. Trouble well, again. I, no. Yeah, well, I, it, has to, it has to be pointed out. But what is the most that I do? Joel, I go, hey, bud, you right? You beat the shit out of me with a with a sock with a soap, th- right? Soap in like it. me getting mad at you is like, come on, it's traumatic, bud, right? Traumatic. It's scary. I know you guys won't recover. <laughs> I'm like, do better next time, Kay. I'm sorry about that. But no. you take that as like, fuck. I know. Yeah, she wasn't mad. She was just disappointed. Yes, which was so much worse. I know. So much worse. It was so much worse. I did it on me. purpose. <laughs> I know. Um, anyways, nobody noticed. I know. So you didn't even, even have to say on anything. That, on that I know. <laughs> I know. So she jumps around from job to job, getting ten thousand dollars, and at this time, ten thousand dollars, not horrible. Oh, back yeah, back yeah, in those days for being that's... surrogate. Um, she finally landed on a job in the local po- uh, post office. Her father actually worked for the U.S. Postal Service most of her life, so. Mm. Family business type stuff, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. As Diane does, she sh- she seduces a married coworker at the postal Damn. office. Is she hot? I mean, you'll you'll I'll know see, by you now. guys uh, will yeah, see. Let's... Now look, you know who she reminds me of is like Twiggy. Yeah, Who's Twiggy? right. The model, seventies model, where it's like big eyes, short blonde hair. Mm. Skinny, like yeah, I don't was, know. She's it was a, she's it was back look. in the day when they still thought that ugly women were attractive. Yes, but we've improved technology. That's over the time. perfect way to put it. Okay, I, the eyebrows totally tweet. Oh, yeah, man. yeah. It, her eyes are too close together. It's but she looking. was. I mean, she was killing it. You're gonna show a picture of her of Stephen. He was mm-hmm. hotty. Like the guy. Like she gets. Stephen was a banger. She gets dudes. Like her first, her husband's high school sweetheart was a cute dude. Well, I, I heard about the way that she seduced 
her uh, one of her later lovers. And I mean, if a woman approached me that way, I'd, I'd go for it too. Oh, for the last baby. Oh yeah, I'm going to talk about yeah. that. Yeah. So uh, she seduces a married coworker. She seemed to go for married dudes a lot. There was something about getting them to either not leave their wife, but at least like risk it all for her. Like it I, made her feel yeah, I like she was better than them or some. It gave she her liked something. The risk and the. The risk, and she also liked feeling like you like me more than your wife, right? Yeah. Like it's she had to always evil. be. Yeah, I think in that, that, competition. Was, that was probably the biggest part of it. Is yeah. it it validated her when she was able to prove to herself that that she was even more attractive than, or the the husband was more attracted to her yes. than. Well, than it's more wife. exciting to go after a, someone who's married, right? Like, ooh, this is. Let's see if I can pull this off. I guess. I don't know. I've never purposely done it. Me neither. But it, this sounds like the kind of person. Yeah. Well, she that does would it like she do it seeks per- out. That's people. hotter. That's more attractive to her. Yes, Probably. it's more attractive to her to like pit herself against other women and win. Right. Mm. So she knows that you have a wife. She's going to compete with the wife, whether the wife knows about it or not, and win. Yeah. She wants right? what she can't have. Yeah. Yes. Married man. So she seduces a married coworker, Robert Knickerbocker, Nick. <laughs> For short, that's way better than Knickerbocker. Yeah, Knickerbocker. I also love that they Robbie call Nicks. him Nick. Yeah. Ooh, Robbie Nick. Robo Knicker. <laughs> Robo. <laughs> what, what did you say? <laughs> Nick. Oh, oh, Knicker. Yeah. Bocker. Yeah. Knicker. Knicker. Bo- Robo Knickerbocker. Robo Knicker. C K. N I C K. It was clear enough. See, Why can't guy? we have slaves? <laughs> <laughs> thug life. Thug yeah, life. Thug life no, 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 I can't. I can't do it for that. So anyways, <laughs> Nick's uh, wife, Nora, and he were having troubles. And he had a fling with Diane. In his mind, it's a fling. He's having troubles with his wife. He's like, this girl's coming on to me. I'm going to fucking do it. Um, but to Diane... It was a lot different. She was infatuated. It didn't help that Nick kept having sex with Diane, but refusing to leave his wife and kind of going back and forth. Now, we hear different things about this, but I really do think that he was, he was messing with a cr- crazy, right? But yeah, he absolutely. kept messing with her. So like hooking up with her, dating her, telling her he was going to leave his wife. He didn't. Then the next day, he's like, I'm not going to, but still hooking up with her and being like, Mm. this is just a fling. And every woman loves to hear, like, this is just sex. I don't like you. Just makes us feel good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's so so loving. He was, you know, he worked her up. um, And this was the wrong person to work up into that kind of nonsense, right? Um. Diane would write him letters, and even when he told her not to, even when he told her not to and that he was done with her, she would not let go. She didn't believe it. He's playing hard to get. You know, stalkery behavior. Um, As a last-ditch effort to get him to kind of make a decision, she was like, I'm moving to Oregon. She's getting transferred. I'm moving to Springfield, Oregon, and he needed to make a decision. So Nick told her that, yes, he wanted to be with her. He wants to move there. Just go and get settled, and I'll meet you there. Now, this is what he said. I could kind of see him being like, if I could just get this crazy lady out of the state. state. (laughs) However I need to do that, she's not going to be able to move back, right? So say yeah. whatever I need to say. Just sure, to I'm going to be with you. Leave. I'm leaving my wife. Yes, I'll be there. Love you. Bye. Probably had sex one last time because he's super cool too. Oh, and you you got to know that she's she's crazy and she's got she's a lot of experience. Bed, I'm sure. Yeah, she's she's got to be great in bed. You got to have one last. Yeah. Crazy fling, especially if she's leaving. Ooh. One last fix right before you go to rehab. That's mm-hmm. how it usually works. Mm-hmm. Crab juice. Word up. So again, we don't know what 
if he was thinking this, if he was doing it just to get rid of her, not sure. I would like to throw it out there that Nick's also kind of a piece of shit for doing, handling I think things so. that way. And that's never really said. Uh, it, doing anything at all, he's fucking married. Exactly. Well, yeah. He's married. People, you know, they don't really get into that, any articles, anything. But, you know, there is something to be said for, like, being, like, completely fucked in the head by someone. Yeah. Uh, when I you think... already have tendencies of, like, being a little bit possessive, crazy, whatever it may be, to have someone mess with you like that. Oh, it's going to take you. You know what you're doing. To the next level. Yeah. Yes. He knew exactly what he was doing. But yes. Considering everything else that happened in the story, holding up a match next to a, a five alarm house fire with children trapped inside that, you know, there is a little bit of a difference. Still, still both fire. Still both sure. shitty, but one is slightly worse than the mm. other. Sure. So a- about a week after she left, Nick called her and told her he wasn't coming <laughs> and that he was staying with his wife and that she needs to just like leave him alone. And she took that soup's good. Um, <laughs> he uh, he also stated that he it wasn't going to work out. He didn't want kids. He had a vasectomy. He didn't want to be daddy to her three kids. Ah, uh, okay. This is the one that I was thinking of. Yes. So he's saying I don't I don't want to be a dad to your three kids. I don't want to be a dad at all. Like probably trying to be like. Make sure she's okay. Like, I like you, but, you know, the situation is just uh, not going to work out. Damn kids. Not knowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Diane seemed to have gotten over this at this point. Um, you know, it's not working out. She's trying to move on in town. So on May 19th, 1983, Diane had taken her three kids to visit her friend, Heather, Um Diane left her friend's house around 9.30 p.m. She kind of stayed there a little bit late. Fine. Been there. Done that. Um, the kids were asleep in the back of the car, back seat of the car, and Hungry Like the Wolf <laughs> was playing. Another I like that possible reference. title. Ooh, that is a good one. Possible title, Hungry Like the Wolf. <laughs> No? They, you know, they, people they, say they, woof and you just want to punch him in the face? <laughs> well, yeah, that's like Hungry W-O-O-F. like the wolf. <laughs> W-O-O-F? Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. Anyways. Personally, I would name you every guys episode are after a me. Duran Duran song if I could, but they don't always fit. Absolutely. So Hungry Like the Wolf was playing <laughs> and they were... It's growing on me Yeah, now. right? Because, yeah. like, you know there's people that would say that not even as a joke. Yeah. <laughs> They close the curtains and they look at the mountains. Oh god! Uh, and library. it's hungry. Yeah, it's the library, the library and it's hungry like the wolf. I say library. <laughs> do you? Yeah, yeah, I do. You guys no. actually made Frustrated. fun of me Frustrated. for saying Frustrated. It on the show before. Oh, really? If, if I hear somebody say it, I'll make fun of them. That's oh, one hundred percent. You have to. I think it's a law. Yeah, yeah I say <laughs> it's, it's I also in, say it's sa- uh, sandwich. It's in the Constitution. Sandwich. Sandwich. That's on purpose. That's got to be on purpose. Nobody. That's nobody on says purpose. sandwich on accident. No, that's because no. I think my mom just always said it. So I just. What happened to your mom? She died from. She alcohol died. Poisoning. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Thug life on you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it digitally. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Uh, so left her friend's house around 9.30 p.m. The kids were asleep in the back seat of the car. Hungry Like the Wolf was playing <laughs> on the radio. They were sightseeing. They were sightseeing. Yeah, 9.30 at night. 9.30 at night. A, they just like to sightsee. It's a good time to go see the countryside. Um, so and over here on... So I've, I've been to Eugene, Oregon before because I've got family up there. Same. So... Pretty much they'd be driving through and it's like, oh, kids, if, if you look out the right side, there's a whole bunch of sagebrush. I know you can't see it, but there's a whole bunch yeah, of sagebrush yeah, yeah. out there and maybe a juniper tree or something. If you look out the right side. It's gorgeous side, out there. Like, not going to lie, but oh, yeah, it's yeah, 930 it's, at night. Your kids are all asleep. Like, we're not sightseeing right now. But again, don't know. She's a weirdo. She may have just been in her own hungry like the wolf world. <laughs> um <laughs> So they were sightseeing. She took a road that she'd never seen before. She she saw a road and she was like, I'm just going to take this. Maybe we'll this road where... leads back to the house. No, I don't even think. I think she was just like, oh, I'm just going to like sightsee over here. Right? Because she's sightseeing right now at 930 at night. The 80s were a totally different time. Totally different time. No judgment. Not a lot of judgment, which is why moms could get away with some fucked up shit. So she had never been on this street before. And in the middle of the road... 
she sees this shaggy haired dude waving his hands next to his old yellow car. So she decides to pull over. As you do. As you do with the three sleeping road, kids alone. As a woman with, with three Single kids mom, in the yeah. But it's the 80s. Like I said, the 80s are true. It's that's true. It's yeah, different time. People were picking up hitchhikers net at this point. Mm-hmm. Like you help Getting people on the boxes. side of the road, right? Diane herself was known for picking up strange men on the road. Exactly. Hitchhikers and whatnot. Well, also, you know, future sexual partners. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's a, a future sexual <laughs> partner to her, huh? Yeah. Well, when, slut. when you're a hammer, everything <laughs> looks like a nail. Yeah. <laughs> Diane. That was good. That was pretty um, good. So Diane pulled over. She turned the car off, took the keys out. She walked up to this man and asked what he needed. And he pulled out a gun and said that he wanted her car. She said, you got to be kidding me. Uh, Just then, he went to the car and shot all three children in the chest. And uh, a couple times in the chest, each of them. The fuck? And body. And Diane began to struggle with him. She fakes throwing the keys like you would with a dog, right? Like, over there, but, like, Mm -hmm. didn't throw them. And while he was distracted, she gets back in the car. He struggles with her and shoots her in the arm two times. Um, What the fuck? The, uh, she shoots her in the arm two times, and Diane, at this point, starts driving away, and the the door closes by itself and she starts driving like a crazy person to the hospital to try and save her kids. You know, when Holy you describe shit. it as when you describe the fake out as like what you would do with the dog, I just pictured that poor guy like coming back out of the bushes in the middle of the road and just looking real sad. Hey, I thought mirror. you threw the keys out here, right? <laughs> threw him. He looks over and it was enough time for her to get back to into the car. Get out of there. So uh, she ran. She drives to the hospital. She runs inside, told the ER attendees that her kids have been shot in the back of her car. Uh, nurses actually noticed that Diane, when she walked in, had a towel wrapped around her arm. And the kids were unattended in the back seat. Just a... They just noticed just it. Just a note. Just a note. Just took note. When you're in a plane crash, you put your own... Your own mask on. mask on first before mm-hmm. you deal with the kids. Yep. Surgeons rushed the children into surgery to see what they could do. Uh, Cheryl Lynn was pronounced dead. Christy had had a stroke and lots of blood loss and was in very critical condition. Um, Couldn't talk, couldn't move, was, um, I mean, a, a stroke victim at that point. Danny was paralyzed from the chest down. So Fucking hell. So this is all happening. She's in the lobby. Again, we've heard this before in some of the cases where it's like people don't cry, right? And you can't really gauge if someone's in shock. They've been shot themselves. They Mm -hmm. just saw something. They're trying to just figure stuff out. And people react to trauma in different ways. Totally differently. So they make note of it always, but it's not always... You know, she fucking killed her own kids. That's what's happening. No, Jesse just know. told you some random dude on the side of the road. A shaggy haired dude. Yeah, shaggy haired man. <laughs> fucking hell. Out of the car and shot all three of her kids and shot her. So the police actually at this point, they come to the hospital because she's in the lobby. It's taking, you know, um, again, Cheryl Lynn has died, but the other kids are cr- very critical, but stable, right? Like they're going to live when uh, the surgeon tells Diane this news she says uh, that he missed her he missed his heart talking about Danny he missed his heart gee whiz that's crazy um, I didn't hear that quote so we're gonna play Joe, I, I think she might have I think she might have done it too now <laughs> A what? I'm only guessing that because I know how this show goes. <laughs> well, then why are you guessing? Because I'm need trying to, hear to guess. All the, you need to hear all the facts. <laughs> yeah. You're making assumptions about this so, poor single mother who got shot along with her children. Well, maybe it's a big twist. Like, maybe she didn't do it. So this is when she's first questioned. She's in the hospital. One she's kid been shot has, twice. She's Once. been shot. 
Her one of her kids has died, and she knows that the other two are in critical condition. I stopped and got out and asked him what was the problem. He said, "I want your car." And I said, "Gee, I'd be kidding. I mean, how many people really do that in real life? They don't." I just kept saying, "God, do what's best. You know, if they gotta die, let them die, but don't let them suffer." So. That's when she's in the hospital. She's saying, you know, talking about the guy coming up. I said, you got to be kidding me. She said, I just kept thinking, you know, if they got to die, die, but don't let them suffer is what she's saying. And it's all <sighs> very deadpan. Everything is very deadpan. You don't see a lot of emotion. Again, this is in the hospital. At this point, you know, it's like, okay, that's, that's the story. People are terrified. Um, everyone got a weird feeling about how she was acting, but it's it wasn't smoking gun, right? Well, it, it is a they little... They took her story for face value and actually began... Everyone began looking for this dude mm. and his car. It's a bit of a red flag when you're in surgery and you're trying to give the surgeon a hand job. So they probably noted that, too. No shit. I mean, this is this is the kind of person that she is. She didn't do that, Joel. Don't. I'm getting creeped out right now. This is fucking me up. So, but Diane, uh, so at this point, there's two kids still in the hospital. One is dead. They have a funeral. Um, and she's saying that they should and just everyone's, die? And everyone's believing it. Well, she's, she's saying these things like... I just don't oh, want them to. Su suffer. I just don't want them to suffer. Like if they've got to die, die. Like she just says these things that are like, I don't know what you're thinking at this point. Let's give you a second. Oh, get out of shock. Like let's see what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um. So at this point, everyone is taking her story. She's like, they. Everyone has sympathy for. Her. They're scared of this guy that's on the loose in Springfield, Oregon. Like everyone's worried when they're driving down the road what you know some guy gonna flag them down i mean now most people aren't gonna stop but so but diane loved the media and the media loved her and diane did so many interviews uh she was just so is that where i'm at yeah uh she was just so confident and so thought she was so much smarter that she did a bunch of interviews. She also gave police access to her home to search her home. Um, let's let's hear the first media interview that she did really quickly. Okay, after so so, so she was soaking it in. She like really attention. quickly after. I mean, within weeks. We were just out, I guess, sightseeing, I guess you'd say. And the kids got tired. They fell asleep in the car. So I decided to just head on home. But I saw a road I hadn't been on before. We like to take back roads. We just went down that road. And there was a guy standing in the road, flagging me down. So I stopped. Everything was done in a matter of five or ten seconds. He swung himself around and fired twice. One caught me in the arm. The other one, I went off somewhere. Danny cried the whole way. I could hear him softly just moaning in... Christy was dying. God, the, all the blood, all the pain. Roll over so she wouldn't choke on the blood. And it didn't dawn on me at the time that the blood was coming from her lung. And as I say, she may be the only one to get me out of this. Would I have brought her to the hospital? Wouldn't she be the one that I would make sure is dead? There are too many holes in it. If I had shot my own children, would I not have done a good job of it? Why would I have taken my kids to the hospital? Wouldn't I have made sure they were dead and then cried crocodile tears? That's insane to think that I would do such a thing and then bring the, the witnesses in against myself. That's crazy. So not a great defense. People try and do it. Like, if I was going to kill them, they would have been dead, right? Like, and that's um, not a great defense. It's, thing to say. It's not a great defense, but it's also just, I know that uh, a lot of the people that we talk about, like a lot of the, the murderers that we talk about on the show are textbook narcissists where they have BPD yes. history on it. Yes, yes. And that is, 
that is also such a narcissistic thing to say. Like, I am, I am so good at everything that I do that if I was going to kill somebody, they would die. They would die. I would do it right. That means I didn't do it because you guys know how good I am at everything. Yes. I wouldn't have messed this up. And brought them to the hospital. Well, why so, was she saying that she didn't kill them in the, her first interview? Like, why is that even being? Why is she even thinking of talking about that? They ask her because she. I was think a, I'm sure she I'm, was a suspect at the time. Not quite yet, but the, she's doing interviews with people that want a story, right? So they're saying, "Did you do this?" Yeah. And she's, I think, feeling a little bit like people are starting to think that. So that's why you do media is because you want to get out in front of stuff. Like if you're hearing that people are thinking that, you want to get out in front of it and get your story because you know you're so smart. And everyone, if they hear your story, they're going to know that you didn't do it, right? So and, she was just like... And they're going to believe you because you can they're gonna believe you anyone because of you're anything. so good. Mm-hmm. Um, she was so confident even that she did a reenactment video. This also oh. is days after. So the the police are feeling a little bit weird at this point, but they're still like going along with it. And they're like, they bring her in um, and they get a car that's very similar to hers. And they have her because they're looking for this guy. So they have her kind of go through exactly what happened to kind of show them like how you got in the door and how he got in the door and whatever. So in this reenactment, it's just fucking strange. She's fixing her makeup in the mirror and is again, one kid has just died. Two are still in the hospital. This is, she's still recovering from being, she's still recovering. She has a cast and, uh, this is how that goes. Sitting in the car is Elizabeth Diane Downs. Like that. I got in the car, jumped in, put the keys in. Dad just hit my cast. Laughing. Started the car and left. The car door shut itself. God. The way that she's <laughs> acting is like okay. working okay. with an actor on a, on a film set. Intend to shoot my arm. So we need to hear that last part uh, just because. Um because she says something again she's laughing the whole time that's so fucked up around. she's joking around and laughing yeah about how her kid was shot and killed right I'm going to do a videotape so the last part this is worse than okay right. this is worse than worse than what when i shot myself she stops herself god she's laughing oh, it hurts so bad it's worse than okay the Many video, people believe that she was about to say it was worse than when I shot myself. Oh, she is, she's eating up the attention so much, and you can tell that in every single interview that, that she does, uh, especially when she's doing the reenactment, because the, the first time that I watched that, what it came across to me is like it's working with an actor on a set. Yes. You know, they're she goes, having okay, fun, here I am. Around. There's even like a part where she goes like, okay, I've got the keys. I'm throwing the keys. Okay, I've got the keys. Like, this is how she's talking, laughing, flirting almost with the detective. Sounded flirty to me. Yeah. yeah. She always sounds flirty. Um, so as we know, a weird feeling and a hunch is not enough for detectives, police to charge someone, right? Yeah. They have those hunches and feelings, and then they need to build the case. And I, I think the DA made the right choice in this situation where he was holding off on making any indictments or pressing any charges because he knew that Letting there her was... fuck herself over. Yeah. Because she did a ton more interviews after this. We'll listen to the weirdest one later. But um, so detectives began at this point to search for a motive. They have a weird feeling, but they're like, why would... And at this time, guys, like the... The world of moms killing their kids, like in Andrea Yates, um, you know, all these other stories that came out had not happened yet. She was one of the first and people couldn't really wrap their head around that. So they were believing her and pushing aside feelings like that because they were just like, there's no way that a mom kills their kids. Right. Because at that point, you know, 83, 82, it just wasn't. A, a big thing. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and there was no big case uh, before that. So um, they began to search for a motive. Fucking and hell. they were also waiting for Christy to recover physically and emotionally from the incident so that they could talk to her. Yeah. Uh, she was at an age where she could tell them what happened, but she was, you know, cognitive issues at this point, having to rehabilitate from a stroke, learning to walk again, um, impaired speech, things like that. So, and also, <laughs> like you said, just absolutely traumatized, traumatized by that, that happened seven years old. And you have to go through that. That's, right. It's going to take you a little while before you even feel comfortable enough to, to say anything about it. Yeah. And kids are no- notoriously difficult to get to talk in any sort of therapy. Right. So it takes a long time to build up the rapport until they're, they trust you enough and feel safe enough with you that, that they'll actually say anything. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so the whole time that they're building this case and, you know, doing the search, uh, Diane continues to talk to the press and digs herself further and further into a hole. Um, this one's, sorry, a little bit longer, but this is the Ann Yeager interview, which she did later on. And, uh, they even said, you can bring your lawyer, like, you know, we want to do this in the right way. It's like ABC or whatever. So they're like, bring your lawyer, like you can have them with you. I know you're, you know. And it's important to note, this is all before any charges have been pressed against her, that she's already going on what's essentially a press tour. Yes. Talking about what happened to her. She 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 got into that as quickly as possible. Quick as possible, thankfully. So she didn't bring anyone with her and (laughs) was just down to fucking talk. Very Ted Bundy of her. Oh no, I'm smarter than any lawyer. This man shot my daughter. My first reaction was to snap back to my childhood, to the pain that had happened to me. Back then, my marriage, my entrapment by society, this man was bigger than me. He was stronger than me. He had more power because he had a gun. And I stood there and I looked at Christy reaching and the blood that just kept gushing out of her mouth. And and what do you do? The gun kept firing and firing and firing. And it, it, it made, it was monotonous. It just kept going. It was like a slow motion picture. When he swung around, he was pointing when he swung around. It hit the tips of my fingers. The gun hit the tips of my fingers. Mm-hmm. And that snapped me. And I went, wait a minute. I'm not trapped by society. I don't care if he is bigger. If I stand here and I say, yeah, here, take the keys. I mean, there's nothing I can do. You win because you have the gun. My kids are going to die. And I'm not going to let my kids die. And so instead of giving him the keys, I feigned throwing the keys. Hero. Absolute hero. He did not take time to point the gun and shoot me, obviously, because he would have shot me the same way he did the kids. When he was swinging in the direction of the keys, firing the gun, he hit my arm. Everybody says, you sure were lucky. Well, I don't feel very lucky. I couldn't tie my damn shoes for about two months. It is very painful. It is still painful. The scar is going to be there forever. I'm going to remember that night for the rest of my life, whether I want to or not. I don't think I was very lucky. I think my kids were lucky. If I had been shot the way they were, we all would have died. The blood splatters on the outside of the car showing Downs shot Cheryl outside of the car. We saw pictures of this so-called spatter. It's drops. When they took the kids, they took Chris and Cher out of the driver's side of the car. And it's blood droplets. What do I see most is blood coming out of Christy's mouth. Because that's what I see. Um, I, I can't see Danny, and I can't see Cher. Cher was laying on the floor. Danny is just crying real, real soft. So, so that sound stays in my mind. When I go to bed, I cry at night. Even now, I still cry. I dream about Cheryl. But at night, when I close my eyes, I can see Christy reaching her hand out to me while I'm driving. And the blood just keep coming out of her mouth. And that, maybe it'll fade too with time, but I, I don't think so. That haunts me the most. But what of Downs' fourth child, the baby about to be born? I'd like to see him try to take this baby from me. And (laughs) I got pregnant because I miss Christy and I miss Danny and I miss Cheryl so much. I'm never going to see Cheryl on earth again. And 
I just, you can't replace children, but you can replace the effect that they give you. And they give me love, they what? give me satisfaction, they give me stability, they give me a reason to live and a reason to be happy, and, and that's gone, they took it from me. But children are so easy to conceive. The father know who he is? Oh yeah. What yeah, and that's fuck? why I won't talk about it, because he feels as privately about this child as I do. But she's smiling a lot. When I go to bed, I cry at night. Even now, I still cry. I dream about Cheryl. <laughs> Every single this interview that she pan, gives, yeah. it, it's, it's like she's, she's on a press tour. It's not right. like she's talking about her dead children. I've, I've seen so many videos of people who have lost their children to, to murder or some sort of violence. And even years and years and years later, they still can't talk about it without getting upset. I mean, like you can I, go I get upset ahead when and I talk about dogs that I've had to put down in the past. Like if I start talking did you put about those, it, did you the, put your the dogs you have now down? Oh, I shot them myself. Yeah. Okay. Good. And that's why it's so hard Gosh, for me I to keep talk about. You I, put I don't, those fucking dogs down, dude. I don't want to talk about it because I don't want to cry on camera. But absolutely, yeah, so I <laughs> did it right. You did right it right. Um, you could go ahead and just put me right in the grave with. One of my kids, if they, I mean, if that ever happened, you can just go ahead and like, I'll, you can have my funeral as well. Exactly. So it's insane to people. But again, at this point, they don't, they've never seen this kind of stuff really, or even this kind of stuff played out in huge interviews on the news. This is NBC, ABC that she's doing all these, giving full access and nobody's really ever seen this. So they're just like. What in the Man, fuck? I guess this is how some people grieve or deal with things, right? Which is, you know, many people's defense a lot of the time. Well, you know, like 911 calls or whatever. Like you pe people deal with shock different, right? Meh. They do when not, they actually commit the not crime. Like yes. this. Right? When yeah. they commit the crime, they are a bit different, right? <laughs> but if you don't, it's pretty across the board. She would be hysterical. Uh, you know, the towel would not be on her arm. It would be on her kids, yeah, tourniquets, we, what uh, have you. Did we mention that already, the towel on her yes. arm? Because she did actually have a, a really serious injury to her left arm that I believe shattered the bone. Where yeah, her, no, her I arm mean, was kind of just dangling by the meat. Yeah, so all but these she interviews. Took the time to, to tie like a triangle sling. Mm-hmm. On her arm. In all the interviews, you know, she's oh, yeah. got a cast, even in the reenactment and everything. Um, in this particular interview, it's towards the end. I think she feels the heat. She's pregnant again. So she's emotional. Right. The detective even banged her. <laughs> um, so she's emotional, but not emotional, right? It, yeah. Well, not emotional about, uh, about what happened to her kids. Dude, if I could be pregnant like her, I would do it. I, I would have been if it was if they were fine easy to with cool. it. <laughs> Shit, she that's, like that's was why she tried just, to turn it into a business. Seriously, like she was just fucking good at being pregnant. The mom part. Not so good. That's not so where good. we get into, you that's know. Where she's that's yeah, where she's there, not great, but the being pregnant part, she's great at that. Why? Because she gets a lot of attention. A lot of people when they say they like being pregnant, it's because you're, you know, you get doors open for you. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, they're fawning over you, talking to you about it, free meals, what have you. Like, I don't know if you have any information about this, but something that I was curious about the whole time that, that I was researching this case was I was wondering if either her or her children had a history of chronic illness where it, it just happened that, that she got sick a lot or maybe one or all of her children got sick a lot. Not really. Not oh, okay, like a Munchausen, I, right? But that's, I, I was that's either, the other way that she could have gone to get attention, right? Yeah. Was like making kids sick or... Because she obviously liked the attention yes. from, from... Well, I mean, liked attention in general, but she obviously liked the attention of being pregnant. And to me, I was assuming Or the that, sympathy, right? Like even this situation, she got a oh. lot of sympathy and outpouring from the community of like, we're so sorry. And that's what kind of gave her the confidence, I think to do all these interviews and let people know the guys out there. If you have any information, that was a lot of her interviews. If you have any information about this guy or who he is, please let us know. We need to find him. And that kind of fuels your, you know, everyone's looking at you and yeah. talking about you. And 
you know, sending condolences and, you know, she was getting a lot of what she needed from that. Right. Absolutely. And the sympathy part, I think is a really big thing is that's, well, the sympathy and the attention she wanted. To, uh, that's why I thought that maybe she had a history of feigning illness or, or getting sick a lot or suffering from some sort of chronic condition because other people similar to her, uh, which I, I think that it's like fairly safe to say that dearest kind of sit. Yeah, yeah. I think it's safe to say that she's got, uh, most likely histrionic personality disorder. Yes, she is actually and, uh, diagnosed later with three different personality three disorders. Three of them. Let me guess. They're all cluster B personality disorders. Yeah, everything that you said. Yeah. Histrionic, that, that. sociopath. Yeah, yeah. Um, Wonderful mother. Exactly the type of woman you want as your mother. Lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so detectives, when they... Uh, so she gives this interview. At this point, detectives were kind of moving in, right? Like they've searched her house. They found diaries. Um, and in those diaries, she went on and on about Robert Knickerbocker, Nick. She also had return letters that she sent to him. She sent him a shit ton. Ooh, like burn. That's like the 1980s version of leaving somebody on ghosted. red. Blocking, yeah. ghosting. Yeah. So he... You know, when she moved and he said he wasn't going to move, she was at this point just like sending letters all the time, writing about it. This is her one love, like where they need to be together, obsession and stalker behavior. So police are like, OK. And I think they even see in the diaries or in the letters that he doesn't want to be a dad. He doesn't want to be daddy to Jesus her kids. Jesus fucking Christ. So they found motive. Um, and it was Nick. Nick was the one that got the vasectomy, right? He had had it already because he never wanted kids. There was so somebody, even with his wife Nora, like they didn't want to have kids. He didn't want to be a dad. There was somebody. Uh, it, it's really hard to narrow it down with the amount of lovers that she had over the course of her life, which she would also brag about in interviews, like subtle brags about oh, so many lovers because there's so many people that that want her. She she's in such high demand. Well, I think she's explaining it, but in the explanation. A lot of the times crazy people make themselves sound crazier, right? So in her explanation, she's like, I dated or I slept with 10 guys in the course of a year and only half of them were married. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like being like she defense. said that I'm straight up in an record. interview, like, like you guys are crazy. I don't always go after. And she's like, that's not a lot, by the way. And at that time, it kind of was like yeah. now it's not and we're very you know oh yeah you're, accepting you're and there's no slut shaming and no kink shaming year. although we should probably kink shame a little bit more just saying just a yeah. little bit Killing we're, your kids so we need to get shame, let's push, kink shame a little push bit push the pendulum back just a just a yeah, tiny little army. bit if, yeah if, if yeah army hammer let's yeah. kink <laughs> shame a little bit right and then you can kind of cannibalism is a step figure out your shit from there once you've been shamed <laughs> right well, what um, I was uh, what I was going to say is uh, one of the guys I I thought that it was Nick that she was talking about uh, because she in one of the interviews she was talking about a person who had had a vasectomy and said that that he didn't want to be a father and she was... decided that that she wanted to have a kid or no uh, she ended up surprisingly getting pregnant with his child quote unquote anyway because the vasectomy obviously had hadn't worked. Oh, now look, that's one that's that one that I didn't right see, but that that sounds right. And again, there's so much footage and of her interviews. I don't doubt that she said that or did that. It is it's unreal how many interviews she gave and and how much she talked and also said almost word for word the exact same thing in every single yes. interview up until she's questioned, then she would kind of adjust the story or mo the her number one defense in any of the interviews when whenever anybody would try to question the story that she was telling was oh you're you're crazy like f just go directly into gaslighting yeah that's crazy a lot of like the first interview that we heard that that's crazy if i was gonna do it wouldn't i have done a good job of it that yeah. defense comes up a lot where she's like if i was gonna do this and if i wanted them dead they would be dead and contradicting herself within a single sentence or just completely disregarding a question uh, insulting yes. the person asking the question and she then was good I mean, she, she was good at she it. She had it down to a science. She'd yes. known it for years. And she and she stuck to her story, which we'll get into later of what you guys actually think. Uh, but 
um, you know, that people can be fucking weird and psycho and bad things can also happen to them, sure. Yeah. But, you know, we're going to leave sure. that. Yeah, sure. Well, I think what she was trying to do with the whole <laughs> vasectomy situation is, so Nick got the vasectomy. She ended up pregnant anyway. And when she confronted Nick about it, she said that he coerced her into having an abortion. And uh, she brought that up in in relation to later when she was justifying being pregnant when, when she yes. was on trial. Yeah. Saying like, oh, I already had somebody tell me once that I can't have a baby. Mm. Um, a lot of her defense, too, and a lot of her indignation, basically, in all these interviews is like, I am a, you know, it's like beginning of first wave feminism, right? So she's like, I'm, you know, I do what I want. Like when she's mm. talking about um, getting pregnant when her husband didn't want to, she was like, I decided that that's what I wanted to do. And I did it. And no man is going to tell me what to do. And then yeah. the guy, shaggy haired stranger, like he had so much power over me and I was going to not let him have that power. And I was flashing back to society and all of this. So she's playing on it, a lot of the things that are happening in that time, which is women are starting to be like, I do what I want to do. You know, mm. I, no man is going to tell me what to do. And she's, she's and it's, playing it's on all the, I, I mean, 100%. Me. like no matter what she's being asked about, she always redirects it to the way that she feels about the situation and the way the, the situation affected her without referencing the fact that she lost one child and has two permanently disabled children. Yes. And in that weird interview that we just heard with Ann Yeager, like, uh, I don't, she says, and I'm going to quote our Lord and Savior, Nancy Grace, but she <laughs> said, uh, she used the word I and me in that interview so many times and never once talked about her kids mm -hmm. without having it be about her. About, I, me, I yeah. feel this way. It made me feel this way. Yeah. I'm never going to be able to, I couldn't it's, tie my shoes for so a month. It, it wasn't just her redirecting that to way, the way that she felt about the situation. It was redirecting it to the, the reasons that she was the real victim yes. in the whole situation. Yes. Uh, because you'd, you'd have to talk about the way you feel to, if somebody's asking you about having three of your children shot, you're going to talk about the way, the way that, it makes you feel, but usually feel. it would be like, I'm devastated. It's, I can't deal with it. It is, I can't get the images of yeah. the kids out of, you know, being hurt out of my mind. I was, you know, not like my, <laughs> and I will say too, this is a classic case of, as we've seen a couple times on this show of like, you know, somebody breaks into the house and your wife is fucking chopped to death and you have a scratch. Yeah. <laughs> We're both attacked, right? And you're like, well, why are you, why are you like totally fine? And somehow you're, you're both in the house and somehow your wife is like chopped into pieces, right? So this is another case of like my kids are shot multiple times and I have a superficial wound on my arm, yeah. right? Well, Somehow. The, the story seems all bullshit from the beginning. Like From the beginning. If I right. was to steal a car, I'd shoot the only person that could hurt me. Well, her second story is more believable. And N No, it's not, actually. <laughs> and again, even if you believe her story, which again has not changed in over 30 years, if you, even if you believe her story, bitch fucking stopped in the middle of the night <laughs> for some weird-ass dude on the side of the road. Mm-hmm. That was one, that was the first thing that made people, any mom at that time, any person that had kids was like, huh? You were sightseeing at ninth. So even her story is insanity, which she even turns around in some interviews. Like this, the story so unbelievable. Why would I do that? If I was the one that did it, why wouldn't I, wouldn't the story be better? And you go, man, you, I mean, you fucked it, you fucked it up. That's, that's also a, you didn't think a possibility, but anyways, so detectives found the diary and she went on and on. It was obsessive stalker behavior. She also said she did not own a, uh, a handgun. She said she didn't own a 22 caliber handgun, which was the weapon. She did own guns at her house, but she said, that's not, I didn't own a handgun. Mm -hmm. They detectives found in the search that that was a lie. 
Um, there was also an eyewitness that came forward saying that he was behind Diane's red car on that road and she was driving so slow that he had to go around her and pass her and was thinking, what the fuck is wrong with that person? Which so means when the kids were shot and she said she was driving like a crazy person, she was actually driving very slow, probably, maybe, to make sure that Wait, the job was done. Right. She was driving so slow that he testified that the speedometer wasn't even registering the speed. So it had to have been below five miles an hour uh, yeah. for the car that he was driving. Yeah. So he's just like, what is going on? But again, 80s, may just be fucking stoners in a car, right? Could have been <laughs> me, <laughs> wasted, having a burger, driving too <laughs> slow and getting Del pulled Taco over. <laughs> Del Taco burger like a fucking loser. I deserve to go to jail. We all know that. Um, so they passed and was just kind of like, all right, whatever, stoners, right? So finally, this is all what the detectives are uh, gathering, mm. right? Um, the diaries, great motive. Murder weapon, which was a gun that she said she didn't have, but she actually did own a 22 caliber. There was an eyewitness. Uh, and then finally, Christy had regained consciousness and her speech. Um, so they were the therapist, the child psychologist was working with her. Um, and she obviously did not want to say who it was. They were like, can you tell us? And she didn't want to say. So they were like, okay, you can write it on a piece of paper. We'll put it in an envelope and put it in the fire. And they kept doing that over and over until she finally was able to not throw it in the fire and open it up. And what it said, we'll see later. So the surgeon that worked on Christy, uh, gave testimony and said or um, talked to the investigators and said that she had no emotion and that she kept asking about her car, her new car, and she just was like hoping that it didn't get ruined with all the blood and kept saying that I hope there isn't, you know, bullet holes in my seat. <laughs> Jesus fucking... <laughs> right, and again, like even the surgeons, like the nurses and everything, they're taking note of it, but they're just going like, I don't know if this lady is like so in shock from seeing to anyone else the worst thing in their life. Like they just didn't know if she was, I mean, having a, a Com nervous like breakdown. Completely basically. distracting basically. Just completely yeah. like, yeah, like disassociating break. or acting like it didn't happen or whatever. You know, there's that definitely does happen. So in the actual hospital, they're taking note of these things, but they're not totally saying like oh she's guilty right um so all these things along with all of the media um now police have what they believe is a case that they can you know take to prosecutors and get an indictment so Damn. they question her <laughs> Uh, finally, so she's been out. This has been nine months <clears throat> that they've been working on this case. She's eight months pregnant. God damn. Um, and they bring her in for an interrogation. Diane, your story stinks. This whole thing is stuff. Then you it's better stuff. get some deodorant. <laughs> <laughs> you changed it by saying that this guy knew you now. He knew your tattoo. He knows about you. Uh, he threatened you. That's a hell of a change from what you said the first time around. There was no reason for you not to say that at the very beginning. Okay. No reason in your mind. And I have one man sitting here looking at me with a face of stone. I have another man over there smoking a cigarette, 90 miles an hour, and pacing. You're not my best buddies. I wouldn't go drinking with you, that's for sure. Well, it's You're two. not my best buddies. It's two men now. No. It's not just one. It's two men. Wrong. And I wouldn't change it if I could. My kids and I always took the back roads. Trying to find out who shot your kids. I didn't hear that. And I'm doing what I can. Fine, I agree. You're going to take the fall for it. If it I wasn't agree. you, then uh, I'm going to quit this job. I'll make you a deal, okay? Next time I remember something, fuck yeah. You can find the guy yourself, because I know I didn't do it. And you can chase your little tails for the next 20,000 years if that's what it takes. You don't like my help, you can fuck it. 
You're real confident in yourself, aren't you? I know, but I didn't do it. Come on, Diane. It's your turn at bat. So if you guys seem to think that I should have brought Diane with me, I would get it myself. Because I know who did it. I you know do who know who did it. Yes, I do. I damn sure do. You know him by yes, name? I yes, I do. Yes. You saw him shoot your kid? Yes. It's pretty important. And I saw him grab my arm and yank my arm out and shoot my arm and say, now try to get away with it. And I'm leaving because I know who did it. Bye. The time is now 1746. And what? Diane is just a part of the office. We're concluding the tape. What in the fuck was there's all that a, shit? I don't know. I kind of like her. A whole lot to unpack. Kind of like her. Oh, if you can make quips with, fucking, during a murder investigation. Dude, if you, murder investigation. <laughs> she's like, fuck you guys. This whole case stinks. You better get some deodorant then. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty gangster. <laughs> yeah. When you are a sociopath, right? It can come off as being a gangster because she's like, she I'm fucking fuck. leaving. Bye. And she just walks out in all in any interrogation. Do you see that? They feel no. like they have to be there. They don't. But she's like, I don't have to fucking be here. But she then says that she knows who did it. And that she could have brought him in with her, but she didn't. And that they can fucking chase their tails for 20,000 years or whatever. Because they need to find who did it. It's not up to her. That God is, damn! That is not dude. Good, but, oh, hey, he made a sh eight months made pregnant. A shot She's all talking three like of my this. Kids, but you know what? It's up to this. Is I'm not doing That's your job. You. For I you. know who did it, but I'm not gonna fuck it. I'm not gonna do what your job because you guys are dicks. I'm not telling you shit. Yeah. Oh, God I, damn! I love. Sh there's a lot of good quotes in that though. Like I've got one guy here with a face of stone. I've got another guy smoking a cigarette. You guys aren't my buddies. I'm not going to go drinking with you, that's for doesn't, sure. Doesn't I mean, she's just Smoking so a cigarette at 90 miles per hour. 90 miles per hour. I'll show you smoking a cigarette 90 <laughs> miles per hour. Um, so, let me get another crime juice. Before crime this. juice. Crime juice. That's, that's a good idea. I'll be right back. Um, so, this was the, the interrogation. At this point, they're like... We got, we have enough. We were just hoping that maybe she would say something in the interview or, you know, give us some information that yeah. would, you know, possibly a confession. They were kind of being like, look, we have all this shit. Like, are you going to confess? And she's like, no, get some deodorant, basically. So <laughs> nine months after the shooting, the shootings, um, they arrest Diane Downs on one count of murder and two counts of attempted murder. Diane's defense, we know, uh, she says it and her story, uh, that's her whole defense. And she has not changed the story, not one word, even from you've got to be kidding me, what she says, I mean, the entire thing, almost like a script. She has not changed this story in 30 years. Fuck. She is stuck to it. This you gotta find this guy. I didn't fucking do it. She did an interview on Oprah years afterwards. This was still during the late eighties, maybe early nineties. I think it was about five years after she was arrested. <clears throat> and still exact same wording exact when same she described wording. everything. Like it, the, the sections of her story. It, it's like you said, it's almost like she was reading from a script and she memorized the lines and every time but those she's topics very are good up, by the way it sounds it always sounds very natural and it always sounds like she's saying it for the first time like she is very good at saying the same thing but making it sound like she's thinking of it for the first time yeah yeah well that's Oscar you know it's the that's part of her being a sociopath is since she's not feeling the emotions that she should be feeling she's able during to the situation, just do, she's able to just spit it out like it's totally like natural. most actors, right? Okay, so <laughs> yep. Uh, huh? Huh? Sorry, why do you agree so quickly? I hate actors. So well, do not, I. Not you. No, All of them. And so do I. No, I do. <laughs> most well, I mean, of them. I, I do Don't too, you? But not you though. I've met. Uh, but 5, am I like an actors. actor? You know what I mean? <laughs> no. No, right? So cool. I, I don't want to talk about acting. I don't want to talk about the process. I don't want to talk about how I'm feeling. Like, yeah, I, I just want to do probably, the fucking job. We should probably reword that. 1% of actors 
are cool. We hate. Good, I think so. We hate good actors because they're just obnoxious. <laughs> gangster, gangster, <laughs> got it back. you fucker, you fucker, you got it back. You got it back. There's one way to hurt me. <laughs> you just did it. So, anyways, um, so trial begins. We, like I said, we know. Diane's uh, defense. She's been saying it all over. Anyone that would listen, you're gonna have to leave it on till the end. Um, <laughs> anyone that would listen, anyone that would take the interview from Oprah to, you know, a- again, NBC, ABC, every she was everywhere. So I, we know what her defense is. Right? I highly recommend uh, anybody that's interested in the case watch the Oprah Winfrey interview because that's a she's good one. Joined by uh, what's her name. Uh, Famous true crime author. So the, oh, Anne Rule. Uh, Anne Rule, yeah. So Anne Rule actually wrote the, did the most research, interviews, everything for years. It's called Small Sacrifices. Yes. It was the book that she wrote about Diane Downs, and she interviewed her and her children and her ex husband and the new guy and Knickerbock, everything. It's like one of the best true crime books. <clears throat> Anne Rule is the best to ever do it. Wait, so she never got to go back and bang that guy? The the reason why she killed her kids? She never got to fuck him again? We'll see. So, so we know her defense. Um, It hasn't changed, like I said, in 30 years. But the jury uh, actually got to see Diane in her full glory. So she is, she's on trial. She is at this point... 100% 100% ready to, I mean, she could give birth any day and she's wearing these cute, I've sent you pictures of it, but it's these cute maternity, you know, dresses and she looks just like this, her hair is longer and she just looks like this perfect mother, eight months pregnant, right? Yeah. And so it's hard for the jury to be like, this pregnant mom kills kids. Like it was very, it was a good move on her part, by the way. It was to be perfectly honest. Yes. And so the jury heard Christy get on the stand and tell the court tearfully that her mom shot her. Um, Also, as if this wasn't, this whole story wasn't bizarre enough. Uh, she so the kid admitted the kid said it. Yeah. So they got her on the Holy on the shit. stand and they asked who shot you and she said my mom. Fucking right. And Diane yeah. even at this point was looking at her daughter snitches when she stitches. got on the stand was looking at her almost like she was still going to protect her. And when she heard that, she like kind of fell back like Okay. Right? Like, I thought, I thought maybe that oh, my I child, thought you were on I my thought side. I scared Damn her it. enough, right? Scared her enough. The surgeon actually, all the nurses as well, testified that every time that uh, Diane would come into the room with Christy, um, who was in a coma basically at this point, basically med- medically induced coma, no signs of life whatsoever, when her mom would come into the room, the vitals would spike. So heart rate and everything where it's like she can't speak to anyone, but she she feels her mom's in the room like everything goes crazy. So that's a that's a kid that you she would think is scared enough that they would. They're not going to still protect you. Right. And she found in the courtroom that that wasn't the case. Also, again, is this if this wasn't bizarre enough. Um, the prosecution, amazingly, this was such a great move, but they decided to play Hungry Like the Wolf in... <laughs> it's good, right? I told you it's good. It's good. It makes you, it, it, it it makes you laugh me. every time, me, right? Yeah. Right? Huh? Hungry I, I mean, like the wolf. <laughs> okay. I don't know how the Patreon people are going to beat that. That's, a, that's, that's the title f- for me. Hungry Spiding like the wolf. Shit, I don't, yeah. I, I don't even know. I just know. didn't make sure that if that... So I sent, like I told you, I sent Ross the anti-free killer. Remember that? Yeah. Stacey Caster, who mispronounced anti-freeze as anti-free. And that's how she got caught. That's how she so got I caught. called 
I put in there, sent it to Ross to post, and I said the anti-free killer, and he's like, "Oh, this fucking dumb dumb," and and we did it right. <laughs> so I just need to make sure that he knows, like, I want it to be hungry like the wolf. It is. It, and it don't is wolf. don't fix my spelling anyway. <laughs> um, so, so they the prosecution decided to play hungry like the wolf in the courtroom. See, good, right? In the courtroom, just to like get, like put either the jury or everybody in the mindset. This is what's playing. She's driving in the car. She's about to like kill her kids. Hungry like the wolf is really getting her fucking. And if Diane I was in the jury, I'd is be like, oh, sitting. Man, this lady's cool as shit. Right. She so can't Diane's be sitting, uh, you know, with her lawyer, and she starts like bopping her head, tapping her foot, like kind of dancing. To the Holy music shit. that her kids were fucking shot to. I mean, Jesus she just Christ. does it herself. She deserves the fucking. She's life so <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent. If God you could put the, if you could put that graphic on her in the courtroom, that would be great. So in 1984, I mean, no surprise, 1984, Diane Downs was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. God damn. Right. Thank God. She's not done. Not the end of the story. She's not done being awesome. So being she was awesome. it. Oh, dude, wait, wait till you Now, look, at this part. point, we can all agree she's fucking gangster. Yeah. I'm sorry sure. what happened to the kids, but we've gotten far enough away from it now. From interrogation to bopping your head to hungry like the wolf. Now you're three years into your prison sentence and she... Like puts on a bunch of clothes and gets an extra jacket and scales an 18 foot fence with two foot of barbed wire, razor like, wire, razor is, wire. That's the hard over part. the top. She scales it, jumps over, and actually is able to hitch a ride with a couple. No fucking way. Yeah, fucking way. <laughs> so she so Diane Dowd started, Dowd started up. escapes high, like. Uh, Leads to a 14, security. 14 state manhunt. Yeah. So everyone's looking for her, right? So she tells this she couple. She breaks out of prison? As soon as she got breaks out, she, out of prison, she was on a manhunt too. Breaks out of prison and flags <gasps> down this car and is like. her boy? That's what everyone. Boy? That's get what that everyone last... thought. So once they found out, what, like once everyone heard, including like the kids, um, the baby that she had in in prison that oh, actually got adopted the uh nick or Bar- like everyone is like alerted and yeah, Robbie they, ha- they now bobby have Nicks? like bobby Ooh, nick bobby nicks yeah that, that, bobby that's, nicks, nicks, that's dude. one right there bobby nicks that's, that's a where good i'd one. be going if i was her so get that d um, one last time she gets into somebody picks her up because again like when you see her she doesn't until she starts talking or whatever she looks like normal mom yeah. You know, white lady, blonde, whatever, young at this point. So a couple picks her up and she tells them that her boyfriend was in an accident. He's at the hospital. Can they please take her to the hospital to see him? But halfway through the drive to the hospital, she she asked them to stop for a pizza. And they were like, are you really wanting to get to your boyfriend? Are you like wanting to chill and have a pizza? Like she is insane because look I'm, so they're I'm like cool we're just gonna leave you we're just gonna leave you here and they left and was just like that was fucking weird so um again 14 state manhunt everybody from arizona to oregon whatever is worried about her somehow coming to get revenge how long was she in prison before she got out three years Damn, she's so fucking badass. She didn't go. She was like Andy Dufresne in Shawshank Redemption. Spent that whole time just putting Planning. together the outfit, figuring yeah. out how to jump over the fence. Yep. All digging, she was missing slowly was slowly digging the hole <laughs> out of the thing. She's like Sylvester Stallone from Escape. Buying plan, clothes from other inmates so that she would. So I guess she like put on just a bunch of clothes so that she could she get, could get over, over the razor. Yeah, giving little handies to the, now look, the prison guards so they look the other direction. Say 100%, what you will. I bet you she did. Say well, what you will. Yeah. 
She was gangster. I mean, say what you will, right? There's not many people that'll that'll like shoot their shot and try to break out of prison. That is insane. And actually balls. get away. And Scaling the razor wire alone? 18 feet. Yeah. I mean, not, so, to, not to give her any respect or anything like that, but shit, I, I can't climb an 18-foot fence. <laughs> I couldn't climb a six-foot at I struggle getting out of a chair. God. So they're thinking that she, God, where is she gone? Is she going to Mexico, Canada? I mean, she's going to, they're worried that she's going to get out of jurisdiction, whatever. So she was actually discovered miles away from the prison, 11 days later, uh, hiding and uh, doing what Diane does in the house of the of a boyfriend of a cellmate that she a, was... A husband. Hus- was it husband? A husband of a oh, cellmate. okay. Husband of the cellmate, and she kind of was helping Diane, like, hey, if you go here, he can help you, not realizing that... She, she was, was probably fuck just him. fucking bone down with him for eleven days, which she did. Um, and Jesus they Christ. they caught her. I sent you a picture. Um, she's being, you know, led out in his like shirt <laughs> and like boxers, <laughs> like kind of hot to be honest. But for that, she got an additional five years, which. So she was banged. <laughs> Yeah, she was blocks God, away damn. from the prison, banging some fucking her cellmate that helped her and escape. Now she's, gotta, yeah. now she's banging his husband, the, her oh, husband. During the Oprah Winfrey interview, that gets brought up. Oh, yeah. And it's so funny how she talks about it because both Oprah and I, I forgot the author's name again. Um, the author of the the Oh, uh, Anne Rule. Yeah, uh, Anne Rule. So both of them are questioning her about her going directly to the husband of one of her cellmates. And in her defense, like nobody was even necessarily directly accusing her of of hooking up with an, another married man. But she was like, hey, look, they hadn't seen each other in five years and they hadn't had sex in five and a half years. Okay? So I was it's doing like, oh, so, you know, duty. You're, you're yeah, no, she the, did. The whole time that. That your cellmate was going through the trial, and then the five years that she spent in prison. Yeah, of course they haven't been together in that amount of time. That. Yeah. So he was horny. Yeah, is what she was saying, and mm-hmm. I was, and I just did what I had to do. <laughs> Don't you think if I wanted to escape, I and really get away, I would have done a better job of it. <laughs> that you kind can't of help shit. but like her. I- I, like I mean, her. at this point, she's gangster, right? I, hate her for, yeah, I mean, like, I don't like kids that much, so that doesn't bother me. She <laughs> exactly right. So um, <laughs> she's discovered 11 days later with this this husband. She got an additional five years. Um, I think it's important to say, too, how she got pregnant during... Additional five? So life in prison plus five? Plus five Yeah, years. so it was like, it <laughs> so really was just like, uh, fuck you. But, they're going to keep her you know, corpse whatever. in the cell for five exactly. years, and then, then she gets married. I think, it's, I think it's an extra five until she will get parole, because she does have, which we will listen to as well. Um, she, had the she has a parole here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. shit. So um, I think it's important to say how she actually got pregnant. I've been waiting for you to bring that up. So she, on her route, on her post, because she was still like in this time when she's doing interviews and she's not a suspect or whatever, she's still postal delivery. And a guy on her route, she kind of like liked him, whatever, and showed up at his door. She apparently said that she knew her cycle so well. She showed up at his door with whiskey and weed and got inside and started hanging out, took off her shirt. And he was like, let's go. And she got pregnant. Damn, one time. One time. As she said, kids are very easy to conceive. Um, <laughs> Jesus fuck. She, so she has she additional also, five She brags years. a lot about her fertility. Yeah, She's always talking about She's how, a boss, how fertile dude. she is. She's a boss. She believes in herself. Yeah. And, and good for her. And I good believe for in her, her, too. Um, <laughs> so she's got an additional five years. And, you know is still in to this day. She's still Christy, alive? Yeah. Christy and Danny. So Danny's paralyzed. Christy is has some impairments, but is, you know, able functioning. Now, I, they I, were I take actually, issue with you saying that Danny's paralyzed because Diane herself has said multiple times that he's gonna Danny's walk not paralyzed. Again. He's going he's gonna to walk again. If I love him enough, if I love him enough, he'll walk again. 
Um, so another interesting part is if this case can't get weird enough, the prosecutor that actually put her oh, away banger? ended up adopting <laughs> no, her surprisingly. kids. So what? The prosecutor that actually, you know, whatever prosecuted the case and essentially put her away. Took uh, care of her kids? Adopted, ended up adopting her two special needs kids at this point. Holy shit. Which is shit. crazy, right? Uh, the baby that she had in prison was adopted to a loving family and is <laughs> fine now. And if you were wondering if Diane is innocent or if you have any like <laughs> debate about it, I mean, we have the parole hearing audio from 2021. Oh, God. We'll listen to a little bit. It's very long, but we'll listen to a little bit. Now what I do have we got? To listen to on the What's our time home? code on this episode? We're about an hour 50. Oh, damn. Oh, wow. Okay. So let's make it a cool, let's make it a cool two. <laughs> um, this fucking crazy bitch. We should just play the whole thing at the end. I spent the past 25 years trying to find answers as opposed to learning how to cut hair or repair air conditioning units. In 2008, Downs had her first parole hearing, Gangster. her hair grayer, her face heavier, her claims of innocence unchanged. All I know is that I did not murder my children, and one year after my uncle was murdered, my children and I were attacked for no reason at all. Her story of that night, stranger than ever. Why is my uncle and his contact from the State Department and their Israeli contact in this book Downs' request for parole was denied. <laughs> really? That you did they not didn't, commit these murders? Or the, the murder and the other crimes didn't. you were convicted of? Absolutely. I didn't commit them and I still maintain my innocence. Somebody in the road flagged us down. I stopped and got out of the got out of my car and he said something to the effect of, I want your car. And I laughed at him. And I said, you've got to be kidding. Because in my mind, those kinds of things don't happen. happen. In Arizona, those they things don't happen. don't happen. I don't know about it's Oregon, but in Arizona, those the things don't happen. thing every time. And so he jumped still into the, the car, leaned into the car, in the and started firing the weapon. And it happened so quickly that by the time he stood up and faced me, it was over. I mean, it was just that fast. I, he said something about the car again, and I struggled with him. The gun discharged. He fell back. I jumped in the car, put the keys in the ignition, and took off. The car door shut by itself. That's it. And I went to the hospital. Why is that? Christy and Dan, uh, Christy and Danny were in the back seat when we got to the hospital. They were still crying. Um, the nurses reported that they were still crying. The state says I that. I was the one that shot them and that I wanted them dead. If that was the case, I would not have taken to the hospital still crying. There are so many other ways to accomplish such a horrific deed if I was going to do it. And certainly bright enough to figure out another way besides some way that looks so absolutely insane and hokey that nobody would believe it. I'm not dumb. Ultimately, you told several different versions of the story when lo when law enforcement investigated this, correct? When you were, when you talked, not correct. Point, ultimately, well, what ha I I understood that. Listen to a little bit um, more. She gets a you told law enforcement to that uh, this was done by two men with ski masks. This is what somebody told me. This uh, it. How do I explain this? I don't know. <laughs> After my children and I were You're attacked, it, the police kept saying, Diane, you must have lapses in your memory because there's holes in this you could drive a semi-truck through. None of this makes sense. Um, you're forgetting something. I believed, because I'd never had any dealings with authorities, and I believed the authorities, and so I thought they did, that I had lapses of memory. I can't tell you how the towel got around my arms, so I know from my own personal experience that I did have at least that much of a lapse of memory. I don't know how the towel got around my arm. So when I, I would have, when people would call me up and people would say, I know so-and-so and he said such-and-such. 
Oh. Um, th well, I have a name, another guy would I'm gonna call have and to say, stop I have so and so and such and such. <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna, so she goes on and on. Uh, some Israeli connections come in. I mean, she is <laughs> rambling. This audio, a, a if you want it, if you want to play it at the end and just have it like roll out, like it is the ramblings of someone that ate like, Nothing has changed. She hasn't learned anything. No remorse. So again, like, if there are people out there that go like, well, I mean, fuck, wouldn't she at this point have... Because the only... Again, with parole hearings, they don't love when you talk about innocence. So if you really want to be paroled, you have to accept that you did whatever crime it is, yeah. you've learned from it, you've grown, you understand. So very rarely, I think probably never, if you go before the parole board and you say, I'm innocent, I didn't do it, they're like, well, then you're not that's leaving. not, I mean, well, that's, we're not, also, it, it's not a courtroom. You it, need to show <clears throat> us that you can be put out and put back into society and be, you know, Re rehabilitated and you can't be rehabilitated unless you admit what you've done so she hasn't learned anything she was diagnosed with three different personality disorders histrionic sociopath and i Either think personality uh borderline personality uh, yeah, disorder uh, yeah bpd histrionic mm -hmm. bpd yeah. hpd and yes. and being a sociopath what do you think joel I love her. It's my I girl. know. He's like, he slowly <laughs> fell in love with her. Yeah. First she was I like, oh, I hate her. I can't <laughs> handle this. And then he was like, this bitch that's is my fucking kind of, crazy. That's my kind and of bitch, yeah. you can kind of be like, I get why dudes are like cool with it. I mean, if some girl, random girl, good looking, whatever, mm -hmm. shows up to your door with whiskey and if, weed and see, takes off her fucking shirt. That. Like, that's the part that won me over. You show do you up to the door mean? with whiskey and weed. If a girl who broke out of prison showed up at my door. Straight up and was like, hey, and weed, I, I was cellmates end. with your wife. <laughs> what up? Like, oh, by the way, it. her justification for breaking out of prison while still claiming her innocence during the Oprah, mm. Oprah Winfrey interview. She said she was looking for revenge. Yeah, she She, she was actually going to look for the shaggy haired stranger. <laughs> she found out he but, was yeah. living in California and she right. was going to go track him down and find him. But she only just made it, uh, after well, she spent a couple weeks with a friend's husband and then she was on the fucking a fortnight at most. Yeah, it, it had been three years. <laughs> yeah, she just needed to take care of that. Poor guy hadn't had sex in five years. <laughs> she just wanted to take care of that real quick, and then she was on the path to revenge. How'd they catch her? How'd they know she was there? Oh, funny. Uh, speaking of um, Shawshank, they actually found a notepad in her uh, in her cell that you know the pages had been ripped off, but they did like the you remember in Shawshank oh. where they did like the pencil, oh, the C, yeah. and it was a map. To this guy's house. Yes. I and, love this. And also a right? To, a, a I'm list, wondering if maybe Shawshank got it from that. A list that yeah. said, to do, break out of prison. Yeah, break out of prison. Sleep with cellmate's husband. Go to find this Find the place. real killer. And it was literally, <laughs> they literally just found, all jokes aside, but they did just find a map from the prison God. to this guy's house and the address. And it was really uh, crude, but I it was still was like so an smart. address. She was. She took the pages with her. She thought she was real smart, too. And she, she was is. counting on everyone being as dumb as you, Coop. <laughs> I'm with her. I think she's innocent. Right? She I think she's just completely you never out of know. fucking mind. Again. Got blamed for Again. It. Like, you can be completely out of your mind crazy person. It's easy Bad to blame things a crazy can person. still happen to you, but... Did they ever find the gun? But again... No, never found the murder weapon. No, but they did find, um, I think, casings at her house that matched. She had a which twenty-two showed rifle. showed that she and actually had the same kind. Yeah, they found one. Uh, so she had a That's twenty-two that, rifle, that and anything. they found one spent shell casing. Uh, but she lied about it. Had she it, not lied that she doesn't own a handgun and mm. had never even... Had she not, then it would be like, okay, I mean, it's... Same. You said that yeah. you owned rifles and handguns. 
She owns guns, too. This bitch is badass. <laughs> right? She's willing to kill her kids for love. I, love I know. This is, that's real I love. knew you'd love her. I knew you'd love her. <laughs> Anyways, thank you guys. A cool twosies. Are we at a cool twosies yep, right now? Exactly, too. A minute or an hour 58. So we got we need to fill two more minutes or else we're not going to meet our quota. Okay, okay then I'll... Uh, okay, my, my title idea... Uh, oh, so, okay, please, so, please, so because, yes, please, so sorry. Because she, so she had a combination of HPD, BPD, and sociopath, uh, mm-hmm. being a sociopath. Mm-hmm. I figured possibly she's suffering from maybe some sort of syndrome. Like, you could, you could name it after her. So she had Diane Down syndrome. <laughs> Whoa! Whoa. That's pretty close good. up camera been, on him. Close up been, on it. I've been sitting on that for this whole fucking episode. Damn, dude! Even you sitting on it and not saying it is the gangster part of it. Well, Diane this Down is, syndrome. This is Jesse Weissman presents Jesse Weissman's Crime Corner. Oh yeah, we didn't uh, do an intro. Presented by I Jesse didn't? Weissman, starring Jesse Weissman. <laughs> right. My I'm idea to out more for, ways to add your name to that because I, I, think, it's fucking, I think it's fucking hilarious. I have another <laughs> possible title. You guys, tell me what you think. <laughs> pro What do you think, right? I have spent the past 25 years trying to find answers as opposed to learning how to cut hair or repair air conditioning units. In 2008, Downs had her first parole hearing. Her hair grayer, her face heavier, her claims of innocence unchanged. All I know is that I did not murder my children, and one year after my uncle was murdered, my children and I were attacked for no reason at all. Her story of that night, stranger than ever. Why is my uncle and his contact from the State Department and their Israeli contact in this book Downs' request for parole was denied. That you did not commit these murders? Or the, the murder and the other crimes you were convicted of? Absolutely. I didn't commit them and I still maintain my innocence. Somebody in the road flagged us down. I stopped and got out of, the, got out of my car. And he said something to the effect of, I want your car. And I laughed at him. And I said, you've got to be kidding. Because in my mind, those kinds of things don't happen. In Arizona, those things don't happen. I don't know about Oregon, but in Arizona, those things don't happen. And so he jumped into the car, leaned into the car, and started firing the weapon. And it happened so quickly that by the time he stood up and faced me, it was over. I mean, it was just that fast. I, he said something about the car again, and I struggled with him. The gun discharged. He fell back. I jumped in the car, put the keys in the ignition, and took off. The car door shut by itself. That's it. And I went to the hospital. Christy and, Dan, uh, Christy and Danny were in the back seat. When we got to the hospital, they were still crying. Um, the nurses reported that they were still crying. The state says I that... I was the one that shot them and that I wanted them dead. If that was the case, I would not have taken to the hospital still crying. There are so many other ways to accomplish such a horrific deed if I was going to do it. And certainly bright enough to figure out another way besides some way that looks so absolutely insane and hokey that nobody would believe it. I'm not dumb. Ultimately, you told several different versions of the story when lo- when law enforcement investigated this, correct? When you were, when you talked not to correct. Point, ultimately, well, what ha- I, I understood that um, you told law enforcement that uh, this was done by two men with ski masks. This is what somebody told me. This it. How do I explain this? After my children and I were attacked, the police kept saying, Diane, you must have lapses in your memory because there's holes in this you could drive a semi-truck through. None of this makes sense. Um, You're forgetting something. I believed, because I'd never had 
any dealings with authorities, and I believed the authorities, and so I thought they did, that I had lapses of memory. I can't tell you how the towel got around my arms, so I know from my own personal experience that I did have at least that much of a lapse of memory. I don't know how the towel got around my arm. So when I, I would have, what people would call me up, and people would say, I know so-and-so, and he said such-and-such. Um, well, I have a na another guy would call and say, I have a neighbor and he has a car that just looks just like that and he's been talking. These kinds of things were being said to me either by phone, people would stop me on my mail route, they would, I worked in Cottage Grove and people would drive all the way to Cottage Grove just to meet me on my mail route and tell me these kinds of things. So I would call the police or I would go to the police and I would say, these, I would say this is what's being told to me. Those are the kinds of things they would say that I changed my story. I wasn't changing my story. I was trying to help. The police kept saying I had lapses of memory. People were calling me and telling me things that I thought, well, maybe this is what happened that I don't know. And so I would tell the police, believing that I was helping them investigate. They didn't tell anybody that these are reports, that I was giving them reports from other people. They would simply say, Diane came in and said such and such. The one about the ski mask was dreams that I was having and they kept saying well maybe you forgot something so when I would have a dream and I would wake up I would think well maybe that's what I would forget and so I the ski mask story I didn't tell the police I was talking to somebody on the phone and I was trying to and I was sharing this dream this thought with somebody trying to understand in the same way that you would talk to a psychologist or a psychiatrist so that you can because if you talk maybe you can reach something. Maybe you can find something that's inside you that's locked off. And so I was sharing this with somebody else and the police were tape recording those phone calls and then said, oh, there she goes. She changed her story. And that wasn't it. And they know that wasn't it. Okay. Well, ma'am, I guess perhaps you could clarify it for me because as you said, I'm, I am the newest person here and I'm asking you new questions. But when I'm reading the pre-sentence investigation and says, Subsequently, defendant gave a total of three different versions of the shooting, including that it was done by two men wearing ski masks and also that she knew the person who shot them. Um, did you not give three different versions of the story? The police said, strangers don't shoot strangers for no reason. So I believe this had to be somebody who knew me. They also, at one point, the last day that I got to see Christy in the hospital, I believe it was June 15th of 83, Doug Welch came to the hospital and said, Steve Downs did this. We know Steve Downs did this. You need to give us, you need to be willing to testify against him. I said, how do you know Steve Downs, my ex-husband? How do you know Steve Downs did this? Give me the evidence. He said, don't worry about the evidence. Just be willing to testify. I said, if you can't prove to me he did it, he's not the one that fired the gun. He said, but he was behind it. I said, I cannot testify against somebody unless you can prove to me that he did this. I know he hates me, but why would he hurt the kids? Doug Welch said, you better be willing to play ball or you'll never see your kids again. And I said, I cannot testify against somebody unless you can prove to me that he did it. The next day when I went to see my children, I was not allowed to see my children ever again. That gave me the belief that the police were absolutely convinced that somebody I knew did this. And if the police believed it, then I believed it. Now, if they want to turn and stall around and say, Diane changed her story, that's not what happened. And you guys are on the parole board. And I know you work with the legal authorities. You work with police. You work with the, with the district attorneys. And so you know how they work. It's how they, I know now what they were trying to do. They were trying to scoop me into a corner so that, I don't know, so that I would say or do something that would incriminate me, which certainly worked. But, but that's not what happened. Though what I'm telling you is exactly what happened. Doug Welch came to the McKinsey, no, to the, uh, the hospital in Springfield. Oh, I can't even think. McKinsey Willamette. No, anyway, to the Springfield Hospital. He sat right there. He caught me when I was coming through the front door. He pulled me into the lobby. And these are the things he said to me. I went to see Christy for 15 minutes because that's all I was allowed. I left. And he was standing there and he goes, I'm not playing, Diane. And I said, prove to me Steve did this. He says, let us worry about the proof. And I said, I can't testify against him unless you can prove to me he did this. And I left. The next day, I did not see my children ever, ever again until court. 
and that was it. And so I believed. I believed what the police, I thought the police believed. Now maybe they did believe that. Maybe to this day they still believe it because Fred Hughey was another time he told my attorney Jim Jagger, Jim Jagger said, Fred, you know Diane is innocent. He said, I know that and you know that, but she's covering for somebody and as long as she's going to cover for somebody, she's going to do that person's time. Jim, oh. said, Jim Jagger said, go ahead. I said, so is it your, Jim, is it, is it what you're saying today is that the, the, prosecutor in your case, the prosecutor in your case knew you were innocent, yet in order to get someone else, to convict someone else for this, he basically threatened to keep your kids from you in order to get you to make incriminating testimony against somebody else? Is that what you're saying? I'm not saying, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that Jim Jagger told me Fred Hughey said this to him. I don't know that Fred Hughey said this. I have no reason to believe Fred Hughey said this now. But that's what Jim Jagger told me Fred Hughey said. So from that point on, I believed, should we? <laughs> from that point on, I believed that Fred Hughey believed that it was somebody that I knew. That's what I'm telling you. It, it, that is what shaped my belief patterns. And so when I would talk to the police, I spoke to the police as if it was somebody that was familiar to me. Not because I believe they were familiar to me, but because Fred Hughey told Jim Jagger and Jim Jagger, Jim Jagger told me that Fred Hughey told him this. I have no reason to believe Fred Hughey would do that. I don't. Fred Hughey adopted my children, I think, during the trial. Can I go ahead and jump ahead with this? Sure. Okay. During the trial, at the very end of the trial, Fred Hughey, they brought in a mock-up of the car, and Fred Hughey got a gun, and he was reenacting the crime. And when he was going through the motions of firing the gun at the Christie doll and at the Cheryl doll and at the Danny doll, he couldn't shoot the Danny doll because the Danny doll was back here. And he raised up, and he looked at me, and I went like this, and he went, he, his face, he had a, fa a look of incredulation on his face, and his mouth started to open, and I nodded my head yes, and he had to switch the gun to the left hand. A right-handed person could not have shot the Danny doll. It was at that time, I don't think at any time before that, did Fred Hughey believe that he was doing anything wrong. I think that he believed full bore that what he was doing was the right thing. But, and I'm not inside Fred Hughey's head, I don't have the right to speak for him, and I won't speak for him, but it was after that he adopted my children and according to Christie, never said a bad word against me, ever. That was out of Christie's mouth. Fred Hughey, in all the time that he raised her, never spoke ill of me. I believe that Fred Hughey knows that there is a man out there that was hunting my children, and it wasn't until after Christie told her schoolmates that I, she, she drew pictures in school, and she said, this is the man who shot us. I didn't, I lied in court because they wanted me to say this and they wouldn't leave me alone, Dr. Peterson. She said, Dr. Peterson kept pressuring me and he wouldn't leave me alone. Those children, the Andresons, told their mother, their mother told her, the, um, the apartment manager, and the apartment manager told somebody. Now, he, he didn't tell my attorney until 1991, but he apparently told somebody before that. But it was at that time when Christie was in that school and classmates with the Andresen twins that Fred Hughey decided to adopt my children. Okay, I so, know. yeah, it's we good. talked about that. Oh. You had, I mean, you had conversations about your needs, but have you thought about their needs? Because your case obviously has attracted some attention. How will it be for them yes. um, with all the potential attention that you living with them might bring upon them? Have you, have you thought about their needs in this? Yes. Every time I call home, I ask them, can we please move? I want them to move to an, another place. When I used to file legal work back before I finally got my answers, and you check and see when my legal work all stopped. It's when I finally got the answers and I was finally able to calm down and just be me again, about 2005. But back in the day when my dad would file, I would, I would write everything. My dad would type it. My mom would copy it, and she would do the filing for all of my legal work. Well, my dad, on the filing page, that's the certificate of mailing, 
you, my dad, you have to sign your name, my dad would always put his address so everybody knows where my parents live. And so every time I would talk to my parents on the phone, not every time, at least once a month when I talked to my parents on the phone, I would say, please, can we move someplace else? I would like to live someplace else where nobody can find you because people are going to be coming by the house all the time, wanting to peek in the windows, wanting to heaven knows what. And I don't want us to have to deal with heaven knows what. My, my dad's 80. He had a stroke two years ago. He's very thin. He's lost 30 pounds. He stumbles. He falls. My goodness gracious, when they were here in August, his whole arm was bruised. I was scared to death that my mom was going to be arrested for battery of an elder. because. And I asked, what happened to you? My mom says, he falls now. And I, I do not want my parents to have to worry about when my mom has to go out and get groceries because my she can't get my dad to get to go in the car. It's easier for my dad to just stay at home. I don't want my mom to have to worry about when she has to go grocery shopping. Is somebody at the end of Quarter Mile Road going to be there throwing tomatoes at the car or, or wanting a signature or can you sign my, my book or whatever? I don't want my, and so I would ask them, please, please just move. And it wasn't until May of this year when it was finally time. They know that they know by ORS 144.228 that my, mat, my parole date was May 9th. And so in April, my mom said, I've decided we're going to move and not tell the kids where we're going. <laughs> I said, OK, OK. But so my parents finally said yes, that they will move. Unfortunately, for me to move, I have to tell you guys where I'm moving, and it's the same as telling the media where I'm moving, and telling the media is telling the wackos, because somehow the wackos always seem to know everything. And the only thing that I can ask is, please, if you do parole me and you allow us to transfer to another state, someplace, please don't tell anybody where we are. I mean, it's the only way that I can keep my parents safe. I'm not worried. Come on, I live with 4,000 of the worst people in humanity, and it's a washing machine. It keeps turning over and turning over. We, we in California, we parole 11,000 people a, a, a month. I mean, a year, and they come right back. So, I, I'm not concerned about my safety, but my parents are old. If you think that it's better for me to parole someplace and never see my parents, and never see my parents again, and that's the only way to keep them safe, then I would do that. But I don't want to not see my parents again. I love my parents. I, my dad needs me to take care of him. He's 80 and he falls. He's a big man. My mom's a little woman. She doesn't, when it finally comes time to start bathing him and taking care of him, my mom isn't going to be able to do that by herself. Sending me someplace away from my parents would not be good for them. I could do it. I could do it. I've cer certainly dealt with, I've lost my children. When somebody takes your children from you, taking your parents is, what's next? But my parents really need me. And so if you're going to parole me someplace to hide me, like you did Janice, well, like the others did Janice Freeman, that's great. But hide my parents too, please. It was back in 85, I saw the eyebrow. It was back in 85, Janice Freeman, when they paroled her, they didn't tell the media where she was. And if you're going to do that for me, do it for my parents. Don't do it for me, do it for my parents, because they do not need the kookaloos. And I know, there you go, there's some insight. This is what insight has done, because I know what kookaloos, I live with kookaloos every day, I've become inured to it. That it, you get, you don't ever get used to kookaloos, but you learn how to survive them. My parents don't know how. My parents, don't, my my mom will do the same thing that I did back in '83. She'll get a phone call and she'll go out to meet somebody. My parents, please don't parole me away from my parents. They need me. They, they as much as you think I'm a danger to them, simply because of the kookaloo factor. If the Kukaloos can't find me, they'll go to my parents. They will. They will. They'll do whatever it takes because Ms. I Downs, know what they do in here. Ms. Downs, I'm, I've got, I, I, 
I'm pleased to hear that you've been able to keep your relationship up with your parents. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, she's... I'm just getting some tissue. Oh, I didn't think I was going to need these this time. Thank you. Okay. Take your time. Okay. The, you've been able to maintain... <laughs> parents um any other you. any other relationships that you've been able to maintain that you'd like to share with that might help you if you release in the community are you, are you involved in any, any in a romantic relationship at all any friendships or anything no none that none that take me there none, none that i would need 